Good evening. Hope all is well tonight. And we're so thankful that you could join us tonight. We have a wonderful program on tap uh, tonight. And we welcome you to uh, Lane College. My name is Dr. Lamont Francis. I'll be filling in for Dr. Lawrence uh, Rashid tonight. And we have a wonderful program that's going to involve a wonderful, wonderful speaker. Um, and I'm just so delighted that you guys can join us tonight. So thank you. Thank you for all those that are watching locally, nationally, and also internationally. Welcome uh, to Lane College. I have the privilege tonight uh, to introduce our guest speaker uh, tonight. Uh, his name is uh, Mr. Jordan Theory. And many of you have probably heard of him, and uh, he's going to tell a lot about himself, but I'm going to just go ahead and give you a uh, brief uh, bio uh, of, of Jordan. Uh, Jordan uh, was born in Western Illinois. He was raised in Portland, Oregon. Uh, he is a product of a biracial relationship, raised by a strong Black father. He attended the University of Oregon, and he studied journalism and communication. Jordan went on um, uh, to, to uh, get a master's in mass communications and media st studies at Harvard, Uni I mean, Howard, excuse me, University. And while he was there, he led the program at the National Coalition of Black Civic uh, Participation called Black Youth Vote. And he went on uh, after that to locate, relocate to uh, Oakland, California, where he uh, did his own film called The Black Fatherhood Project. Many of you are probably familiar with that. At this time, Jordan uh, went on and he uh, wrote his own book, a book that uh, entails and, and deals with systemic racism. And what is interesting about this book is that it is a children's book. And so it is teaching young people, young Black uh, students about how systemic racism works. And so we are delighted uh, that uh, Jordan is with us tonight. And so Jordan, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I know I didn't do your bio any justice, but you have done a lot uh, in, in, in your young life. And so thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, just a little bit about your background and a little bit about uh, yourself and what do you want the people to know about you? Yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Francis. Um, you, you know, you covered the basis uh, of, of, of the background. Um, I would just say that, you know, for me, I wasn't necessarily a real uh, focused uh, student or much of an academic um, throughout my whole sort of K through 12 experience, but really, you know, started to wake up in college um, you know, the, my freshman year of college, I read, you know, autobiography Malcolm X and, and really uh, flipped a switch for me personally mm -hmm. and, and uh, gave my life purpose. And so from that point on, I really just tried to um, do work that is, is, you know, impacting our communities, impacting our people, improving conditions and eliminating barriers um, and, and also making sure the stuff that I enjoy and I'm passionate about. And so um, you know, after I finished at uh, Howard, achieving my master's, uh, you know, I went on to teach uh, fourth grade in, in New York, New Jersey, and kind of came back to Portland, um, was working with funders around um, voting rights uh, issues, uh, and then uh, and then kind of then went to, to finally finish that Black, Black Fatherhood Project film, which I've been working on, you know, on and off for seven years. So that was a, a culmination of pretty much a lot of my work in my 20s. Um, and then had the, had the great honor and privilege of, of going and working with an organization called Policy Link that's based in Oakland, California, um, doing education policy advocacy work, working on eliminating the, the school to prison pipeline. Um, and that, that's also kind of you know, around the time I connected uh, with Dr. Rashid. Um, and over the last two years, I've been focusing on just my own business, uh, Dream Chase Media, um, and I work with a lot of nonprofit organizations and foundations around issues of racial justice, um, education, um, and try to mix in my skills with storytelling and media production in that as well. Perfect, perfect. Talk about your, your, your life. You, um, uh, in, in your biography, 
Um, you, you mentioned that um, you were raised in Portland, Oregon in a biracial family. Talk about some of the, the, the issues or struggles that you may have had growing up in a biracial family in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, it's super interesting, right? So I can, I can speak with some specifics knowing that, uh, you know, there, there are some people familiar with the, with the communities. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I grew, uh, I grew up in Beaverton and at that time in Aloha to be specific, and at that time, it was um, a very, you know, predominantly white community. It's gotten a lot more diverse in, in the years since then. Um, but, you know, I was always the only black kid in my class, uh, my whole experience. I did not have a black teacher uh, throughout my whole K through 12 experience. Mm. And, um, and also, you know, I'm, I'm, for the people of Oregon, at least, I'm black presenting, right? So. My, my multiracial identity wasn't really known unless I let it be known, um, which is, was a different experience than my brother because he's a lot lighter than I am. Um, and so you always get sort of those kind of weird reactions as well. Um, but look, I, I noticed this, this thing about systemic racism very early on. I, obviously I was, you know, had direct uh, experiences with just being shut out from playing with certain kids uh, you know, having my difference pointed out often you know, on a, almost a daily basis, um, as as was the norm, um, and just internalized that, and I and I and I you know knew that I was different, and I embraced I embraced it. So that 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 actually sort of then you know created more of a thirst to have more of a stronger connection to you know black communities and black culture. And I was just really lucky that, you know, my father's side of my family was really tight and really close. And I got to spend my summers, you know, back in Illinois with, with all my black family, which really, I think, helped build up that confidence that a lot of my other um, peers that were, were also black in, in Beaverton uh, didn't necessarily get to have, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I think that that kind of create, created some, some, some tension, some issues uh, for them as well, but you know, I was getting kicked out of class on on a regular <laughs> basis. You know, I was I remember fourth grade, I was put out in the hallway uh, for uh, two weeks straight. Uh, they just put my desk out there because I was just talk too talkative, you know. Mm -hmm. And my you know, my parents actually never ever found out about that, right? And that 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 was just the kind of stuff that was happening while I was. Now that I'm a, an advocate and I understand yes. and a former teacher, um, losing so much instructional time, right? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and robbing me of my educational experience and my parents not even knowing that that's going on, you know? And, and so that's a, that's a civil rights issue, right? That's right. So, uh, so that was the norm though. That was the norm. And, and for a lot of us black boys in the Beaverton School District, that was what it, that's what a lot of our realities look like. We was always getting kicked out of class. You know, it was just, it wasn't an affirming environment for us academically. It was a, affirming for us socially, but not academically. So, that, so, so, so yeah. in, in that, in, in that, in that, Jordan, so you mentioned a number of uh, incidences where you experienced covert and overt racism, correct? In, in the, um, the public schools and a, and a number of racial microaggressions. So then what takes, what, what, what happened? Um, you know, what, what, what is the, the one thing that, 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 that went on in your head that told you, hey, I want to leave Beaverton and I want to leave the state of Oregon and I want to go to Howard University. And, and, and if anybody knows about Howard University, that is one of the, the best HBCUs in the country, right? It, it, is, it is the top of the top to go all the way to DC. What made you want to do that after having a K-12 experience where you saw no one that looked like you. Well, you know, then I went to University of Oregon, right? And I, all right. <laughs> but, but like what I'm saying is it wasn't that much different of an experience, right? I mean, I had one black professor my whole time at, at U of O as well, right? But luckily we had the, you know, the university had resources and supports for students of color, all those federal programs, that mm -hmm. offered, and I'm blanking on the names of all the federal programs, but you know what I'm talking about. Yes, that offer, you know, the free uh, tutoring, counseling, all those sorts of things for students of color or low-income students. 
um, that I, I was able to benefit from to catch up academically because I had a lot to catch up on, but then also the university's resources for student programming was so important. You know, so I was the chair of the BSU. I was the chair of the uh, Black Student Journalist Association. And I was a, a, a co-director of the Multicultural Center at U of O. And so that was like a, just a really powerful space for me to really start to get my organizing chops. You know what I mean? And, um, but just created more of that hunger and started, you know, becoming more aware of the inequities um, and wanting to, you know, go to Howard and kind of be in that space with other very, uh, <laughs> very, very just bright black folks from all over the world. You know what I mean? And yeah. Able to, you know, um, build with them was just an incredible opportunity. I went to visit and I said, all right, that's, and that's this is it. All right. So <laughs> you're at University of Oregon. What made you want to, um, to, to, to know more about blackness in a white space? What, what made self-identity so important when you're in Oregon? What, 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 what was it that, that, that made you want to know more about Black people and not necessarily fall victim to white assimilation? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's easy, right? We saw, we saw a lot of that in U of O, at least when I was there. Um, and the, okay, I'm not very good at speaking to this particular point yet, but white liberal folks that think they're down really wanting to be cool with you are actually oftentimes more problematic than just straight up racist people. How so? And that is the experience that I had at U of O because mm -hmm. I was being tokenized in a different kind of way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I actually felt like people were trying to befriend me because I was black and I, they wanted a black friend and they wanted validation, right? And they wanted mm -hmm. to be progressive. Um, so, I mean, you know, you, 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 there's a lot of that in Oregon, right? There's a lot of that yeah. across the country, but in Oregon in particular, in my experience, um, and you, you're aware of it, especially after, after you start to build relationships, you kind of see where people's priorities are and, and little comments that people make. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we had a small group of, of black students at U of O and we just, that was just a, a common experience that we really bonded on, you know? Um, and I was just, I was just, I was tired, man. You know, I was tired. I almost got, I, I had a job opportunity at, at KVAL, the local news station there after I graduated, which was a great opportunity from a career standpoint. But I was like, I can't stay out here, man. You know, this is just, this is not going to feed my soul. This is not going to put me on the direction that I want uh, to pursue as an advocate for our people. I need to go be in closer proximity and deal and, and be in spaces where that history is there too. And DC was, was that place for sure. So so now you, you you decide to go to one of the, if not the best HBCU uh, in the country. And HBCUs, we know, produce over 40% of the America's black teachers, over 70% of the America's black dentists and doctors. And so you go to this place, the, the they call Howard the Mecca, right? Um, so you go to the Mecca and you leave there and you decide to get into education and teach fourth grade. Why become a teacher? Mm, yeah, that's <laughs> a great question, right? Um, I, I decided to become a teacher because I wanted to be on the ground in a community um, and really work in close relationship with some of our communities that are most vulnerable. In so, Jersey of all places. Newark, New Jersey, Brick City. Why, oh, yes, yeah, and we know all oh. about that. We, we learned about <laughs> Whitney Houston. Whitney Houston told us about Newark. But, but so you decide to go to the inner city and then you decide to teach elementary school. Yeah. I, not a lot of black men, right? Because we know the majority of elementary school teachers are white middle-class female. Yeah. So why, why elementary school? You know, that was just, it wasn't my original um, choice. I, I wanted to teach middle school English, uh, but there weren't any jobs and there was a demand for elementary school teachers, especially black males. So I said, okay, that's cool. I can do that. And it was, I mean, it was just um, 
uh, you can't overstate how important it is because you're just like you said, there's so few males and black males in particular that are elementary teachers and, the, and, and our young people need it. They need to see men in those spaces as well as, as women, right? And our young boys really need it. And, a, and the funny thing was, I saw the difference, right? So in my classroom, my boys, they were good. They were not ever the problem. They were, you know, because, you know, I loved them and, 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 and took care of them. Um, my girls were always my problem. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, oh, no, I was a fourth grade teacher. I was a fourth grade teacher in the city. This, I, I was standing little scuffles. You're absolutely before. right. <laughs> the boys at that age are very loyal. Yeah. Very loyal. Yeah. And they love you. They love you. Yeah. They love you. Okay, so now you, you, your teacher, you decide to come back to the left coast. And you're coming yeah. back and you're, you're in Oaktown. Yeah. Oaktown. And so oh, Portland, Orlando. Go back to Portland first. Went to Portland first. Yeah. Then you go to the Bay, right? Well, I was work. I was working for an organization in the Bay, but I was actually living in LA to be. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. Got you. Got you. So, while you're in the Bay, you, um, you, you know, let's let's talk about the movie. Let's talk about the the Black Fatherhood Project. What was that about? What were you trying? What was your objective in that particular movie and that that project? And what were you trying to convey to the society as a whole? So I started out was just like, I want to counter the narrative of the deadbeat Black dad. That was okay. the initial goal, right? So I just started interviewing dads that were like, you know, good dads, right? And then as I got into it, I was like, this is cool, but I'm really just ignoring the elephant in the room, which is why there is a stereotype in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that, that's when I decided I need an explanation for myself. And I know I'm not the only one. So let's get into it. And I started interviewing these historians and I, and, and I worked my way backwards in terms of talking to scholars because I started with sort of crack epidemic, the 80s, yes. uh, war on drugs. And then it was like, okay, that gives me a little bit of answer, but I gotta go further back. I go further yes. back. And I kept going further back all the way to uh, the point where I was interviewing Dr. Wade Nobles, uh, who was able to talk about the, the Black family's uh, structure in West African societies pre-slavery. Mm -hmm. And yes. how that was broken up with slavery and sort of everything kind of spun out from that point. So if 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 today they say about two thirds of African American homes are hit by women, right? And 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 I think you pointed out um, that even during slavery, when um, marriage was outlawed, we we you know we we didn't see this decline in marriage. We didn't see it in 1920s, 1940s. Majority of black homes still had you know, a, a, a father and a mother. What happened? What happened to the father? What happened to the African-American father in the home? In a, in a nutshell. You mentioned the crack epidemic and, and mass incarceration. But right, on. that was just, just the latest iteration of public policy undermining the black family. Um, and so that is, that is it. That has always been the case for us here in this country, right? The policies have always undermined our, uh, our ability to thrive, our ability to want to stay together. And the film kind of just provides a few of those examples, uh, like the fact that in the Jim Crow South, it was just impossible for black men to find work um, that wasn't sharecropping, right? That wasn't basically a, just a new iteration of slavery. So a lot of men went up north to find you know, jobs in factories and, and even and get educations and, and even get professional jobs. But families stayed back. Sometimes the families followed. Sometimes that, that was the end of it, right? Because before cell phones, it's before all that, right? So there was that case, right? Um, there was the no man in the house rule that yes. if you wanted to get your welfare uh, benefits, you do not allowed to have a man in the house. That's right. right. So th those are the things that just two examples of many that undermine the, the black family and kind of discourage the breakup. All right, and so as we as we close, and I know there is so much I, I want to ask. I, I didn't get to most of my questions, but I I, I want to know about this book, this children's book on systemic racism. Systemic racism is not something that children are are taught. 
right, in elementary schools, right? And, and elementary schools, really the major objection is socialization, right? Black boys can't read or write, but they know the words to Jingle Bells and the Pledge of Allegiance, right? So if, uh, why, why introduce race so early? And people would say, they don't need to know about that. They need to know about Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. Why introduce systemic racism so early in this book? And tell us about the book. Yeah, absolutely. I just put the link to the book in, in the chat. Oh, uh, so, you know, shout out to, to uh, the founder of a kid's book about company, uh, my boy Jelani Memory, Wilson High School, Portland, Oregon, also uh, a, a, a brother my age, um, who founded this company and really connected with me to, to, you know, build off of the book that he wrote about racism to go deeper on a systemic level. And what we decided was, you know, we had this conversation shortly after George Floyd was murdered. Um, that there, there need, we need to go deeper because this keeps happening and people don't understand all the depth behind our systems, our public institutions um, mm -hmm. that allow this, the murders to, to continue and thrive. Um, and so just touching on systemic racism, we thought would be really important. But the thing about the children's books is that it's really, of course, it is very important to, to talk to these kids about these issues. But I think what we found, and especially with my book, the parents need the help talking about these issues and learning about them themselves. That's so nice. they think they're doing something for their kids, but they're also really doing something for themselves, right? And um, the, the whole design of the book is really uh, targeted to just help people talk to their kids and be a conversation starter not the end. When you close the book, that should not be the end of the conversation. That should be the beginning of the conversation. And we have to build a pipeline of young people that are going to go and fight these um, uh, inequitable uh, laws and administrative policies within our government and within our, our companies. And it's going to take waves of generations to undo all of the harm that currently exists. So, 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 so you have, you have, um, I, you know, the, the book, the book obviously is groundbreaking because it's for young people. It's for elementary school, you know, uh, kids, right? And, and I couldn't imagine sitting around in story time and listening to a story about systemic racism, right? Because that's the thing that's not supposed to exist. Is this book also for white kids? Absolutely. Absolutely. This book is for all kids. If, if anything... Okay. I want the white kids to read it more because it's their work to do. Yes, sir. You know? Yes, but, sir. So it's for white, white, white students, uh, students of all different backgrounds to kind of understand because racism not only affects people of color, but it also hurts white people as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that, 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 is, that is perfect. And so how can people get the book? How is it available? Sure. Um, so you can, so I just, um, I posted the, the link uh, in the chat uh, to the book, uh, you can buy it directly from a kid's book about company. Um, it's also available on Amazon. Um, excuse me, if you put in a kid's book about kids book about racism, you'll find it. Um, or if you just put in my name, Jordan Theory, you'll find it on Amazon, and you can buy the Kindle version as well uh, or the ebook. So, so yeah, it's out there, and you know, I, I encourage people to check it out for sure. Right. Thank you so much, Mr. Jordan Thank Theory. You. This was this was a great interview. I, I wish I had more time because I, I, I want to ask you so many questions. You have such an interesting uh, life to be so young. And I, and I know that the uh, the sky is the limit. You're just getting started. The best is still yet to come. I, I know this. You're going to change the definitely change the world. And so we, we, we thank you uh, for, for joining us. And, and so at this time, we're gonna go ahead and uh, transition to a video. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and transition to a video. And then um, afterwards, uh, we will see you on the other side and we're gonna talk a little bit about black Greek life. Uh, so thank you again, uh, uh, Mr. Theory. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us here at Lane College. Thank you. Federal law allows citizens to reproduce, distribute, or exhibit portions of copyrighted motion pictures, videotapes, or video discs under certain circumstances without authorization of the copyright holder. 
This is called fair use and is allowed for purposes of criticism, news reporting, teaching, and parody, which doesn't infringe of copyright under 17 U.S.C. 107. Information presented is intended for educational purposes only and does not replace independent critical judgment. Statements of facts and opinions expressed by way of video, audio, or other modes of technology are those of that specific group and or individual, and, unless expressly stated to the contrary, are not the opinions or positions of Lane Community College, its sponsors, and or affiliates. Lane Community College does not endorse or approve and assumes no responsibility for the content, accuracy, or completeness of any information presented throughout the presentation. At least half a million children in the United States have been poisoned by lead. It could have been prevented. And kids are still poisoned every day. Lead in household paint, once marketed as durable and safe, became recognized as toxic, especially to children. It was banned in 1978, but lead paint still exists in tens of millions of older U.S. homes. Once it starts to flake, the paint chips and dust can put lead into the air, soil, and our bodies. Is this the, this is the yellow house? Yes, that's the yellow house. This house poisoned Joshua almost three years ago. When Joshua's family rented the home, they had no warning. And it says that lead hazards were found uh, contributing whole or part to a child's poisoning. And then just kind of list all over the house, windows, yeah. walls, foundation, that's shed walls. The porch, the deck. Lead is invisible. But even though they couldn't see the metal in their home, Joe and Ebony knew their son was changing in front of them. We kind of brushed it on the rug a little bit and, until he started biting, kicking, punching. He would hurt us. How do you catch yourself? Well, did you use soap? Go back. Go use soap. He's back to normal kid stuff now, but it's unclear what kind of effect the lead will have on him in the future. His lead levels were so high back then that he had to be hospitalized. They had him in like this, this crib that looked like quarantine. Wow. It was a cage. It was like a baby jail, if you ask me. And um, he would shake it all the time. He would shake it and scream. So we couldn't bring him home until we found a place. Children are the most susceptible to lead. Their bodies absorb higher rates of the metal than adults. Joe and Ebony were told there was no way they could take their son back to the same home. They said if we did not, if we did not find a place within that week, they, they was going to put him in foster care. The city? The city was going to take our baby and put him in foster care until we found a place. So we didn't sleep. He took off a week of work, but I was still going to work. Uh -huh. um, we was hunting day and night, even in the dark. He's emotional. I'm emotional. Um, our baby's in the hospital, and we don't have a place to live now. I'm basically homeless for a week. Like so many families, they learned about lead too late. It's now something Joshua will always have to live with. You have parents that don't have an idea about lead poisoning. Right. And, you know, they move in these neighborhoods where they, they can afford their budgets, yeah. you know, and they're not, they're not thinking about their kids' health. They're thinking about just having a roof over their head. And the sad part about it is the kids pay for it. Hi hey everyone, my name is Pablo Alvarez. I was the former environmental and climate justice coordinator for both Beyond Toxics and the NAACP of Lane County. I was a graduate of the University of Oregon. Uh, my journey in this environmental justice realm really stems from my lived experience and uh, being born and raised in Guatemala City uh, to traveling around, around uh, Germany and South Africa and a uh, brief internship that I did in uh, Washington, D.C. So a lot of experiences have come together to really form a environmental justice organizer in me. Um, and uh, what we're going to be talking about today is specifically how environmental and climate justice affects the lives of students and their families. So we'll, we'll jump a little bit into what that actually means. So what we mean by environmental justice Environmental justice, the definition that we like using in the organizer 
space is the equitable treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, taking into consideration race, color, national origin, gender, able-bodiedness, and uh, income, particularly when it comes into public policy and uh, the public policy that affects our direct uh, and, and built environment and climate. Yeah. The reason why we uh, use this definition is because uh, the EPA uses the definition that's uh, similar to this one, but instead of using the terms taking into consideration, the terms that they use is uh, despite or uh, not, not taking into consideration race, color, national origin. And that impact that that has on, on public policy is a really colorblind effect. And what we know from colorblind policy is that when uh, social and uh, hierarchical and class uh, factors aren't taking into consideration when doing public policy and other types of things like city planning, uh, the people who you would most expect to be impacted negatively are the ones that most are most impacted negatively. You really have to take an intentional approach to city planning and to uh, the people that are going to be affected by policy because the people at the city council or at the state level who are making the decisions usually do not reflect the people who are most affected. So a couple examples of what happened is that in the 1960s, we had a big movement called Not In My Backyard. Uh, and so one of the problems is that it's backyard, right? If you're, if you're saying not in my backyard, first, you have to own a backyard, you have to own a house. And secondly, if it's not in your backyard, what you're really saying is place a minority's backyard, right? So that's why it moved from NIMBY to PIMBY. So a couple of examples that we can think of here is uh, Louisiana Cancer Alley. We have a, a stretch of 120 miles of, uh, of a road in, in Louisiana where 125 petrochemical companies exist. It's the biggest out of the United States. And that area of Louisiana, which is majority black communities, has the highest rates of cancer out of anywhere in the United States. Another example is Old Smoky in Florida. It was a trash incinerator that for years and years and years had been given people uh, really bad health outcomes and diseases. And the city actually knew about it, but instead of closing down the trash incinerator, they expanded it. And so what ended up happening when they expanded it is that they were, they were burning so much trash that it actually ended up hurting white communities that lived further away because the direct community around them were mostly uh, black and Latino. And once it started hurting the white communities is when the, when, when the old smoky uh, trash incinerator was actually closed. So it took white people getting sick to be able to actually close down the trash incinerator. Uh, other examples are uranium mining in Native American lands for the longest time since the 1930s, uh, gold mining and uranium mining, specifically uranium mining for purposes of war and um, well, war in terms of atomic bombs and stuff like that, but also uh, for nuclear energy. Uh, has significantly affected Native American land, specifically in the Southwest. We're talking about Southwest uh, Wyoming, uh, Utah, Arizona, Colorado. Those areas have been highly impacted by this mining because when you mine, you have to drill into the land and use a lot of water that again goes into the groundwater where people drink. And uh, the last one is maquiladoras along the Rio Grande in, in the Mexican and uh, US border. These are textile manufacturers that, well, our clothes require dye, but that dye that they put into our clothes is highly toxic. So there's ways to dispose of it in clean ways, but a lot of these textile manufacturers, if the EPA isn't being strong enough to hold them accountable, especially now under the administration that we had, a lot of these dyes are just dumped into the river. This is particularly bad for Latino communities in the Rio Grande that get their water from the river to be able to consume uh, because the dye being so toxic, what ends up happening is that uh, that area of Texas and the Mexican border has the highest rate of anencephaly, which is the when, when babies are born either with an extremely underdeveloped brain or without a brain altogether. Um, and that is directly linked to these textile manufacturers and the dyes that they're putting into our, our, our clothes. And so those are examples of, of the United States as a whole, but we have similar examples in Oregon. So the McCormick and Baxter in North Portland 
if you're familiar with the Portland area, you know that North Northeast Portland is the the uh, historically black community in Oregon in in Oregon specifically because that was one of the only places where they were allowed to to work for the longest time because Oregon was a a, a white only state. So they would live in Vancouver, Washington, and cross into Oregon to be able to work and go back. And then once they were allowed to 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 live in Oregon, they they, they started living specifically in Portland. And what happened with the McCormick and Baxter in North Portland was that this uh, manufacturing, this industrial polluter came into place. They polluted the area so badly that the EPA actually had to close them down and force them to clean. But after that, they had already uh, gotten so many people sick. Uh, the Covanta trash incinerator is actually in uh, Brooks, Oregon, which if you know, Brooks, Oregon is one of the highest Latino populations outside of Waterburn, Oregon. Uh, it's a trash incinerator. And what, what's different about this trash incinerator is that it actually also burns medical waste. So there's a lot of toxic pollution that goes into it. Uh, the trash incinerator is really bad because they tried to donate money to uh, political operatives in, 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 in Salem to actually give them tax credit to be counted as a renewable energy source. What we know about trash, trash incineration is that it is not a renewable energy. So trash incineration can be uh, can be burnt. Trash can be burnt to get rid of trash, but sometimes it can also be burnt to be able to capture the, the methane that comes out of the trash and create energy out of it. It's the worst way to create energy. There's other energy sources like uh, solar and wind and geothermal that are far less deadly and, and in many ways are actually cheaper. And then the last example is that uh, in Eugene specifically, 99% of all toxic polluting chemicals actually come from the 90, uh, 97402 uh, zip code, which is the Bethel, West Eugene area. So in, uh, while I was an environmental justice coordinator for Beyond Toxics, what we ended up doing was a, a health study for these communities living so closely to this industrial pollution out in Bethel. And so these were a couple of the, of the results. Uh, actually, this is what it looks like. So you can see this industrial pollution right before behind residential communities, something that you would never in a million years see near rich households, near white households. It's just something that you wouldn't see. Uh, this is a park in Trainsong. Can you imagine if this was what parks looked like anywhere near college campus or anywhere near uh, the South Hills is just, it, it wouldn't be a thing. And again, this is city council, right? The city maintains these parks. So they're purposefully not maintaining these parks. This is right behind that park, polluted surface water, children play in ponds all the time and go out and play in, in the summer. And then this one, this lady is, is seeing the industrial pollution from her front yard, right? That's, and it, and it smells really bad. If you're ever out in West Eugene in the Bethel area, you can, you can, you can smell it, it's pretty bad. So this is the disparity. So this is the air pollution in all of West Eugene. So the 97402 zip code. And this is the rest of all of Eugene combined, right? So Eugene has seven zip codes, I believe, 97401, two, three, four, five, and then it jumps to uh, seven and eight, I believe. Um, so this is just that 97402 zip code. And this is all zip codes combined. So you can see that the, the disparities in industrial toxic and in industrial toxics are really big. And so this actually results in that the West Eugene community has an 18 year lower life expectancy than the rest of the city. So in, in, in Los Angeles, they did a study where by just putting air filters in classrooms, it had a huge educational uh, effect. So for the longest time in LA, they had been trying to uh, bring test scores back up and nothing had worked. They had tried multiple things. And what ended up happening is that by just installing uh, air filters in, in certain classrooms, uh, the, the test scores from those classrooms significantly increased. Uh, also, uh, as we saw from the, from the slides before, air pollution has a huge effect on developmental disabilities. Uh, you can see that West Eugene has high amounts of developmental disabilities. That's meaning different things like ADHD, uh, all of the different developmental disabilities that we that we associate. The rest of Eugene, uh, it's closer to zero point, I think four percent, but it, it rounded down to zero. Um, that's a big issue, right? When students, uh, the amount of resources that schools put to 
uh, students with developmental disabilities is really poor in, in the United States and in Eugene as well. And so if you have a higher number of people with disabilities, not only is it a problem because it's disproportionate, it's just a problem about how you're going to provide the best services to those students. Again, the difference in minority population is big because this also takes into effect uh, income and income distributions are a are, are, are problem because we fund our schools through our property taxes. So if we have poor communities of color that are, that are disproportionately paying less in property taxes because their property values are, are, are less, then their schools are going to be disproportionately underfunded. Right. This could be changed very easily by putting all of the property taxes into one giant pool in the city and distributing it in an equitable manner. But we know who would be against that and who it ends up affecting the most. Uh, these are the different uh, diseases that we were getting uh, from the area that were very, very high uh, compared to the rest of Eugene. Um, this is the diabetes. Um, well, something that's interesting about diabetes is that a lot of people is associate it with sugar consumption, but you can see that there's not really a correlation here as sugar was, was uh, consumption was rising in the United States. Um, diabetes is actually pretty low, even though it was rising significantly, but chemical production and diabetes prevalence is almost a nearly identical correlation, right? So again, causation doesn't equal, uh, uh, correlation does not equal causation, but uh, we can see that it's highly, highly correlated. And we do know that uh, chemical production and certain chemical pollution does affect diabetes. Again, this is more in diseases. Uh, if you are somewhere, you can pause it and actually see the, what the, the difference is. What ends up happening is that the, the, in, in West Eugene, uh, the asthma is actually really, really high. Uh, and so this is a problem because of chronic absenteeism for for students. So asthma is actually very high in communities of color all across the United States. And so what ends up happening is that if you're missing a lot of school due to asthma or all of the other diseases that we that we that we mentioned, it's gonna it's gonna impact your performance and achievement throughout your entire uh, career, right? And so uh, we know that this creates uh, a problem for uh, school to prison pipelines if you're constantly seen by teachers as the one that's always uh, late for class or not at class. Uh, it starts creating the social uh, view that you're just not as interested in school as other students. And in fact, it might just be that you're living in an area that is causing you to have more asthma or other health issues that prevent you from going to school. And lastly, and very importantly, different strategies like uh, defunding the police where you could get huge budgets from police that we have seen that are extremely inefficient in a lot of cities. They actually don't solve that much crime and actually putting that into different pots of money that could actually go into helping the community and stopping crime and uh, all of the different things that we associate with that. So affordable housing, job training, education, mental health counseling is a really big one. Um, substance abuse treatment and one that is missing here is those clean energy jobs, right? You could put that, uh, that money that the police is using right now and you could actually put it into different things like renovating homes, even very simple things like uh, thickening the windows of certain houses, like older houses could save people money in utilities. So one of the biggest problems right now is that uh, poor people are paying more money in electricity than rich people are because their houses are less energy efficient. And so you could take some of that budget, create grants or loans or different types of, uh, of programs to help people uh, better their houses or change their lead piping or uh, create better air filtration systems. Uh, there's different things that could go into place. So uh, thank you for listening to my to to my to my presentation today. Went a little bit over, so I hope that's fine. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, Dr. Rashid will, uh, uh, has my email. You can text me. Um, you can email me. Uh, message with any questions and please get involved with the NAACP of Eugene Springfield and Beyond Toxics. They are the ones leading uh, this type of work in Eugene and really in the whole state. So uh, feel free to contact me whenever you want. Thank you for having me today. My place in the world and in the story.
Hey, this is Felicia with me on the page. And tonight um, I invited a few of the kids from my um, Kind Readers and Writers Children's Book Club to answer a couple of questions. Um, one question was um, how they felt when they saw characters in books that looked like them. And the second question that I asked them was how did they feel about having African-American um, uh, teachers and we live in an area that is still the dominant teaching um, teaching race is white um, most of the kids that I was talking to have never had an African-American teacher and I am it whether they had me through um, a community program but they have not had teachers of color um, so that was a very, very interesting uh, question when I asked them and the responses. And the other thing that I really uh, took note of was the fact that our children are being taught so young to give safe answers. They're, they're, they're being taught um, how to answer in politically correct ways. And I know what was really in their heart many of them did not express on our interactive um, Google slide sheet. So that's just one observation um, that I that I made and I, I, I can sense it. I can sense it as a mother, I can sense it as a teacher, and I can sense it from just growing up that they felt like I should give a soft answer and not tell you how I really feel. So I hope that you enjoy their responses. I like good stories. When I have a teacher that looks like me, I wouldn't mind if they were nice. This is the look I have when there is a teacher that looks like me. Happy. I am happy the book is funny and the characters look like me. I like teachers who look like me to be nice. I feel like I'm meeting a black civil rights person. I would like school more if I had a teacher that looked like me. I think about black history artists, civil rights artists, because it's black books. I understand more instead of feeling confused and left out. With teachers that look like me, I feel more excited about what I do. I feel connected to the books that I read because everything in those books helps me understand who I'm going to be when I grow up. I would like my teacher to look like me. When I had one in kindergarten, it felt like I got treated better. I feel excited and happy. And his mother added, I noticed Christian is more engaged and less shy with teachers who look like him. When I see people in books that look like me, I feel excited. When I don't see people like me in the books, I don't care. I would like my teacher to look like me. When I had one in kindergarten, it felt like I got treated better. I'd like a lady teacher. I feel good when I see characters that look like me. I can relate to what they are doing. When I see people in books that look like me, I feel shocked because there are not many people who look like me. Absolutely fine. I want my teacher to look like me. I would want a male teacher. I don't know how to feel when I see characters that look like me. It's cool to have a teacher who looks like me. It was cool to read a book to my brother that looks like us, Black Lives Matter. I would like a teacher who looks like me to be fun and nice. My name is Felicia Lang, and um, I'm a children's author, and I write books for children of color. Um, my primary motivation for beginning my multicultural series was the fact that my students in the classroom did not have books um, with characters that looked like them. They were few and far and in between. And I began to see the self-esteem of young children, um, the, the 
the bright glimmer that they had in their eyes when they came into the classroom when they're in kindergarten and when they're in first grade and they began to be inundated with books and literature and curriculum that did not connect to their everyday lives they began to um i could just say just kind of like cower and um, my chief motivation how i got into writing children's books was the fact that um one of my daughters my oldest daughter went through what was i call it an identity crisis all of her teachers were white she was in a white area um and she began to not like her skin, to not like her hair. And I couldn't understand this. I, um, I was wanting to know what was I doing wrong as a parent. So I began to look for literature and books because she was an avid reader. I began to look for books with children of color and I started ordering them from across the country. And this was in the, this was in the, the 90s. And I was trying to find resources that would help to promote, um, you know, black girls of color, children of color in a positive light. Um, and um, I went on a very long trek and this trek led me to go back to school to get my master's in reading, but with a specialty in multicultural literature. So as I went into the classroom, this same scenario revisited itself when I have my first grade students. And I began to notice that they were learning to read, they loved to read, but reaching for characters that, and, and books with people and families like theirs, again, wasn't very prevalent. So I purposed in my heart that I was going to make books and that's how I began writing children's books. My focus and my primary um, my primary mission is the early readers because the earlier we get them, the earlier that we can pump their self-esteem to affirm them, to validate them, to let them know their self-worth, um, the greater our outcomes. And as I mentioned, working in early education, I see our kids so bright and so full of energy. They know all the answers. And then they begin to get inundated with culture and with literature and with curriculum that they don't have connections to. So that is my goal with me on the page publishing is that I will write books for children of color, primarily African-American children, but I will also write for the children that I teach in my classroom. Um, so you will find a very diverse um, group of characters in each book that I write. You can learn more about Felicia Lang at www.meonthepage.com. Hi everyone, my name is Songo. Hello, I'm Hobby. And today we're gonna to be talking to you guys about microaggressions. So in this first image that we're showing you, we want you to take a look and note that this is a microaggression, how the police officer is questioning this black man in this suburban neighborhood because he feels like he can't own a house there. And this microaggression is rooted and established in racism because black men are always seen in a certain way to certain people. Right, and he has a um, an image in his head about what Black men should do and where they should be, and that doesn't match up with um, the Black men in that neighborhood because he feels like uh, Black people in general should not live in a neighborhood that is nice, um, probably in his head. So we have um, defi a definition of microaggression um, and our own definitions. We would like to share that with you. In the, defini in the um, dictionary, um, the definition of microaggression is a statement, action, or incident regarded as an instance of indirect, subtle, or unintentional discrimination against members of marginalized groups such as racial or ethnic minority. And then my definition of microaggressions is actually really close to it. Um, it's asking people insensitive things, um, and those people generally are in marginalized groups. And my own definition, I don't really keep track, but 
I recognize my co-workers by when somebody says something or does something and it the action is usually rooted within how I look physically, whether that be, you know, my race or my culture. And it doesn't sit right with me and it doesn't sound right. But if I were to call it out, people would be confused because they wouldn't see it as direct racism, but it's still really insensitive. Um, I myself have lived in, the, in Eugene, Oregon for about 10 years now. Um, I moved here when I was eight years old. So throughout the years, I have experienced various um, examples of microaggression, uh, rather it's from peers to teachers to people in the community. Um, usually they don't mean it, but it still hurts and it still needs to be acknowledged and we still need to work for, we, need, we all need to work together to, um, to w bring awareness to what microaggressions are and what they can and how they feel when uh, somebody says these things to you. Um, I have some examples. Um, one is you are my slave. Um, this comment was said by a peer. Um, it was in, I believe, fourth grade. I don't know what the attention was behind it. Um, I believe it was the person thought it was a joke or, but it didn't feel like that. And um, th this comment is a microaggression that people can really see what's wrong with it because it doesn't sound right. Um, it's more in your face. Um, is that your sister pointing to another black girl? I get this all the time. I have very many black friends. Um, so when you're placed with them, um, people are always making those types of comments um, and then being followed in stores. This is a nonverbal microaggression, I would say. Um, and is that it, your hair is so beautiful while touching your hair? I believe this is, it just feels wrong when pe people just walk up to you, people that you don't know, you don't have a relationship with, um, and they come and just touch your hair. Um, it's very uncalled for, and it feels like they're objectifying you as, a, as an animal, and I don't like the feeling of that. I think those are really great examples, and there are some that I can definitely relate to, and the problem with people touching black women's hair is really big because they usually would never go up to a random person they don't know that isn't a person of color and start touching their hair but they think that it's okay to start touching arms because it's in braids they've never seen it before but it's still really disrespectful and intrusive to our personal space how have my friends been affected so microaggressions have become a very normal part in the lives of many minorities living in America. I personally know people who have been teased for being too white to be considered a person of color, too light to be considered um, a victim of racism. So I have friends of, you know, all backgrounds and they seem to identify within their own ethnicity, however, people of the same ethnicity think, oh, you're too light to be this, you're too light to be that, you look too white, um, or you're too light skin, or you're light skin, so you don't know what racism feels like, when in reality, that's not true, and anybody can experience microaggressions, no matter what they may look like, and no matter how dark or light their skin might be. I myself have always gotten questions from my hair, and it's really it's been so normal within my life ever since i've been growing up here i've been questioned for my hair and it seems to be weird because it's always me but it's none of my peers so whenever i have braids people ask me is that all your real hair or where does your real hair stop or what does your natural hair look like and it's very disrespectful because I don't see why what I do with my own hair is a part of anybody else's business and I've personally been made fun for my skin color but it was okay because it was a joke so my skin color has been compared to oh your skin color is the same color as poop 
and it was okay to say because it was a joke and if I tried speaking up it was like okay why are you getting butt hurt it was just a joke like chill out and that can be a really big problem trying to address microaggressions because a lot of the times people don't understand how harsh it can be and how badly it can affect someone and they might just want to brush it off as a joke and my workplace um there have for the whole Black Lives Matter movement, they put up a lot of Black Lives Matter signs, but a white person came in saying that the Black Lives Matter sign made them very uncomfortable and they had to take them all down. And it just shows that, you know, people who don't even understand why we choose to support the movement, but they might feel very uncomfortable and they might feel the need to intrude on things that aren't any of their business goes to show how bad the situation can be. And also a lot of my friends always have to point out race. So they might say, oh, I don't really like Asians or I don't really like black guys, but this guy is really cute. And it really shouldn't matter if some, like what someone's race is, if you find them attractive, you find them attractive. Example number one. In this video, you see a black woman in character as a white woman stating things that are commonly said to black women. These statements are not only extremely ignorant, but unfortunately also very common in today's world. How the woman in the video acts and the way she thinks about things shows and highlights the privilege that many white people in America have. Also how they truly feel on topics that do not concern or directly affect them. So what's really sad about this video is that a lot of Black women can definitely relate to a lot of the things that has been said to them. And in this video, I've definitely faced these comments before in my personal life. And it goes to show you how common microaggressions truly are and how bad of a problem that it is in today's world. It's so mundane all of these comments that she says throughout the video, it seems like we hear them all the time. And the sad thing is, like you said, it's every day. Like these are mundane things that people hear all the time. And to see that um, everybody goes through this is truly just sad. So let's watch the video. Not to be racist, but not to sound racist, but not to sound racist. My grandma hates collards. Wait, is that racist? Why isn't there a white entertainment television? The Jews were slaves too. You don't hear us complaining about it all the time. Is it like bad to do blackface? Is that still like a thing? You can say the N-word, but I can't. How is that okay? My best friend was black. I mean, she's still black. Oh, we're not really friends anymore. Oh my God, I'm practically black. Twinsies. <laughs> I told you to stop borrowing my lotion. Why is my computer acting so ghetto? This is so ghetto, ghetto. I'm not really into black guys though. So cute for a black guy, right? That one kind of looks like you. <laughs> Tanisha, what did you do to my computer? Can I touch it? Okay, I'm already touching it a little. Is this real? Is this all yours? Wait, it's not real? It is. It is. Okay, sorry. So happy. Kind of feels like a Brillo pad. Oh, did that hurt? Oh, sorry. Sorry. You guys can do so much with your hair. Kind of feels like Cheetos. Hey, do you know a Tyrone Jenkins? He just requested me. I don't know. He's black. Girlfriend. Holler. Holler. Sorry, girlfriend. He could get it. Sorry, can we turn it down? I don't really like rap. Boom, ba doom, boom, boom, ba doom, boom, bass. I gotta call you back. There's an Oprah rerun on. I think what I like the most about them is they're not like stereotypical like black people. You know what I mean? It's almost like you're not black. Have you seen this shit black girl say? Kind of racist. I felt it was important to talk about this subject while walking, uh, especially considering we're talking about respect respectability politics uh, here in Eugene, which is essentially 
uh, the idea of you know dressing a certain way and acting a certain way in order to fit in to uh, Eugene's white culture. So I guess my um, jumping around is coming to say, uh, realistically, if you're black, or you know, it's, it's it goes deeper than that, right? So right now we're specifically speaking to or of the experiences of of a person of African descent, a person who was visibly visibly black or brown um, in their experiences in Eugene. Um, you know, obviously those those experiences are amplified if you're a woman. Those experiences are amplified if you're gay or trans. I just say you gotta be yourself. You know what I'm saying? Like, for example, I wore this jacket. Let me see if I can get. It. I'm using a gimbal. This jacket. One of the last things my mother's bought me. It's a big old fluffy Sean John coat. I don't really wear it in public too much because this jacket, ever since I got it, it, it gets attention from white folks. You know, they'll make jokes about it. Like, whose jacket is this? Who would wear this? Call it gaudy or whatever, but it's warm. It's nice. It's made by a black developer. So I wear it. Not develop, black designer, not black developer, but to that I say, you just gotta do, be yourself, you know? I got Black Lives Matter tattooed on my knuckles. It's a little faded. Um, when I got it, I remember being told by my peers that they were job stoppers. And my first tattoo was a job stopper. And, you know, I don't understand why you would why you would tattoo something like that. And to them I say, you know, I tattooed Black Lives Knuckles on my Black Lives Matter on my knuckles because I'm an artist, I'm a writer. And I want for every pen stroke and every word that I type for me to be reminded of why I'm doing that. I also have my wedding ring. I want to be reminded of who I'm doing this for and what I'm doing this for. And you know, uh, the reality is, you know, if, if people aren't gonna hire me, it's not because of my tattoos. They had already decided they wouldn't hire me when they saw me to begin with probably before even seeing my tattoos. Plus, like I said, I don't know if anybody is familiar with with knuckle tattoos, they, they fade. So, you know, uh, they're, they're definitely very painful and they, they, are, they, don't, <laughs> they don't last very long. Um, to that, like, like I said, I, I say, you know, as far as respectability politics and your dress and your style, you should always dress how you want. Um, wear your hair how you want, because ultimately what's going to be your, your main key in success is your intelligence and your attitude. And part of your attitude is your confidence. Um, growing up in a community like this with so uh, few black people, and you know, uh, you know, the number one thing people listen to is the Grateful Dead. Uh, you know, I personally, when I think of the Grateful Dead, I see them as being uh, a tribute to white mediocrity. Uh, the fact that a band can become one of the most famous bands in the world while um, playing off rhythm on purpose seems to me to be, uh, if, there, if there's ever a, a way of, of describing white America in their, in their taste, that's it. But you got to make the best of it. And, and, rep yourself and you know if you like the Grateful Dead you know rock some Grateful Dead stuff you know don't don't not rock it because I don't like it you know uh, I'm a sneakerhead you know I I sometimes will you know always have spent more money on shoes than I should have some people think it's not smart but that's what I do you know and I have I, don't, I really don't care how people feel about it you know I got my septum a lot of people don't like that you know I got my ears gauged, you know, and, and ultimately none of these things have stopped me from, from achieving what it is that I want to achieve. Um, obviously, there are people that will hold you back, but the most important thing you can do is when you encounter those people is to look for a second option. Don't keep on knocking on the same doors, you know, like uh, I've read and seen many of, of articles and stories where people will 
you know, say something to the effect of, I tried to get a job at Apple or Facebook. They didn't hire me, so I applied and applied and applied over and over. You know, uh, I wouldn't do that with Apple or Facebook, but, you know, um, I do that with the New York Times. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it really depends on what it is that you want. I also suggest if you are going to go down that route that you look at who the CEOs are, follow their policies, see what, see if, 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 because uh, problems start from the top. You know, we've seen it in the last four years of this administration. Um, you know, it, it, it goes, it goes pretty far back, but most importantly, the, if, if they choose not to respect you, it's not going to be because of your dress. It's not going to be because of your hair. It's not going to be because of your nose ring or your tattoos. It's going to be because you're black, you know, or, you know, you're black and you're gay or you're black and you're short or you're black and you're uh, not wealthy or whatever. You're not athletic. Um, and they will make all these other excuses. Meanwhile, in their own communities, the expectations aren't that high. Um, the respect for white people comes from, well, you're white and, you know, uh, your dad, uh, you know, grew up on my street, so you're cool. You know, even though that person, you know, could be a rapist or that person could be a drug addict. The expectations are higher for that. Um, you know, you can, you can use that as a, as a motivation or you can let it stop you. Um, I've chosen to use it as a motivation. The title of the book that I've, I've written about this is Whistling Vivaldi, and it's taken from a story of an African-American, uh, he's, he's now an editorialist for the New York Times, Brent Staples, a uh, large African-American guy, and when he was uh, showed up for graduate school at the University of Chicago years ago, and walks down the street dressed like a student and so on, he realizes that uh, he's making whites uncomfortable and they're avoiding eye contact and sometimes even crossing the street to stay out of his way. Um, and he realizes from their behavior that they're seeing him stereotypically. They're thinking of him as a possibly menacing African-American male on the south side of Chicago and they're apprehensive and they're moving away from him. So he's being seen through the lens of that stereotype. There, there's a huge social impact there of a, uh, on, on him and it's depressing to him. And he writes about this in his his autobiography, um, he eventually learns a little simple tactic, which is that as he walks down the street, if he whistles Beatles tunes and whistles Vivaldi, then he's seen completely differently. He's just seen as a, as a, uh, a black graduate student at the University of Chicago and not as a potentially menacing guy. So with, the, with that behavior, it, it punctures uh, the stereotype. It makes the people in his environment not use that stereotype uh, uh, in, in viewing him. So you're standing in line at Walmart holding a CD watching a procession of fitted caps. Today, 50 Cent's Get Rich or Die Trying has been released and his fans are here. <laughs> Boys swallowed by their father's jeans, sporting robe-sized hoodies, praising the bullet hole halo circling Curtis Jackson's crucifix. It is the year you move to a town where the people watch gangster rap videos like National Geographic specials. A pearl mob clutching bags and backing away whenever you approach. As the only dark-skinned G-Unit monk here, naturally, the cashier is taken aback when you hand her a copy of The Johnson Academy Presents <laughs> Vivaldi, The Four Seasons. When she asks you about the CD, you tell her about the grocery store clerk, how you walked into the store, headphones bumping music, and an aisle full of white kids. He patted you down, hands alive with certainty, and when he found nothing, he told you to never come back. You figured it was the music. The slick rhyme spilling out of your ears, riding into a cavalcade of beats into the old man's best rendition of spring. You figured that maybe if you learned his song, branded each note into your mouth, he would let you back into the store, but he never did. But that summer, you stopped listening to hip hop in public. 
Stocked up on letterman jackets and college hoodies, you told your language to pull its pants up, to talk straight, to talk with some goddamn respect. You didn't want to seem too urban for your new town. In 2010, Brett Staples coined the term whistling Vivaldi. It recounts college days when he'd hum, pu- he'd hum to himself in public to put the whites around him at ease. But in Cambridge, black Harvard professors still get arrested for going home. In North Carolina, a college degree won't stop a cop from emptying a clip into an unarmed graduate. And in Detroit, an honor student's pleas for help are only answered with shotgun. You've been whistling Vivaldi your whole life. And even when you went to college and got a good degree and wore clothes that fit, you have never not sounded like a police siren to them because no one gives a f- that violence is not your name, that theft is not instinct, that you were not born a sin. They just want you to be a kerosene conductor, a matchstick maestro to sing Vivaldi in ash and cinder, to play tunes in the key of drive-bys, because fear is still this country's violin, and you are the scariest song in the show. At this time, we're going to have Mr. Pitts. If you can uh, talk to us about Black Greek life, it's time, Mr. Pitts. Hey, what's up, y'all? Uh, y'all have to excuse the COVID beard, but hey, uh, I still look good. Uh, my name is Damian Pitts. Uh, I'm an academic advisor and diversity initiative specialist at the Lundquist College of Business at the University of Oregon. Uh, I'm also a member of uh, Cal Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated and have been the appointed advisor of the Delta Alpha chapter a chapter that as of tomorrow has been in existence 70 years, but currently d- does not have any active members. Uh, now, uh, I probably won't even take that long, but you know, I'm, I'm here to, when we think about upper mobility and success and brother and sisterhood and unity, one of the first things that I think about is black Greek organizations. Now I know some of you uh, may think of these organizations being somewhat elitist, uh, and I'm not going to disagree with you, but then when you look at the history of these organizations and why they were founded, they were to uh, support Black brothers and sisters who were in this collegial system that were not being supported. My fraternity specifically was founded in 1911 in Bloomington, Indiana, uh, and so they were founded out of safety. Uh, because for those of you who know anything about the ways of the Klan and know what happened a few years after 1911 in Indiana specifically, you can just imagine what was going on before that. Uh, and so one thing that I will say is that um, th- these organizations might not necessarily be for everybody, you know, which doesn't mean that these organizations aren't gonna support you. Uh, the, the, the organizations in Oregon have had a tough time uh, sustaining themselves due to lack of interest, lack of knowledge, but then also the way that we operate, it makes it sometimes a little tougher for us, especially when you have a large number of black men and women who are very comfortable around whiteness, they'll join uh, predominantly white fraternities and sororities, which are fine in some situations, but on the tail end, you hear a lot of them speak of them being tokenized, them being treated a certain way, them not being able to, uh, you know, implement elements of their culture. And so, you know, kind of to tie it to the last part of the video, like they whistle Vivaldi all the time, even though they don't know what Vivaldi is when they really want to whistle Tupac, Uh, which, you know, meaning that they get to be themselves in in these black Greek organizations. And so, uh, in closing, I just want to say that uh, if, if any of you are interested in any of these organizations, whether it's mine or other ones, we can put you in contact with the right people. Uh, also, uh, I, I, I challenge you to challenge these Black Greek organizations that exist in the state of Oregon to thrive and to support you. You know, our organizations were founded on community building. And, and things as such. And so what's the purpose of being an organization if you aren't gonna help those that helped you get there? And so once again, the challenge goes both ways. I challenge you all to uplift and educate uh, our young black sisters and brothers to understand the role of black Greek organizations within the community, 
but I also challenge you to challenge these organizations to uplift your children, uplift your elders, uplift the history that exists here, uh, that exists within Black Greek organizations throughout the world. And that's it. Thank you so much, Mr. Pitts. Thank you so much. That was very enlightening. Uh, thank you for letting us know about uh, the Greek organizations that exist uh, here in this uh, Oregon community. So at this time, uh, we've had a, a, a wonderful night. We're going to keep this thing going. Um, we've, we have some questions uh, from you, and uh, we have a, a wonderful um, a panel of guests. And so what we're going to do is go ahead and start with the first question that came from you. And this question is for Mr. Uh, Mr. Theory. Uh, so uh, Mr. Theory, Jordan Theory, uh, the question is this, who were the main sources of your home training on coping with systemic racism, microaggressions, and how to skillfully micro resist? And then it has in parentheses micro resistance is your skilled response to microaggressions. And so again, who are the main sources of your home training on coping with systemic racism, microaggression, and how to skillfully micro resist? It's a theory. That's uh, that's a, that question's too smart for me, man. I, 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 I'll tell you what I, what I do know. Um, so I've recently been interviewing grandmothers for, for my, my next film, which is about grandmothers, okay? And, and my grandmother, similar to the other grandmothers that I interviewed, I asked them about racism and sexism, you know? And shockingly to me, a lot of them were like, well, I never really faced any of that in my life. I'm like, you 80 year old black woman, what you talking about? You live in Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, what are you talking about, right? But it, but it was this. It, I mean, it was like you, you couldn't actually pay that that much mind to it because you had to survive. You didn't have necessarily headspace to sit and soak on it. You, you know, you knew from what your parents told you and their parents told them. Don't pay them. Don't pay them fools no mind. You right. know they're gonna act a fool. You take care of what you got to take care of. Um, and that's how my parents raised me. I mean, so so I don't know what the micro response was, but all I knew was I, I didn't pay them any mind because I knew they were fools. And I had something I had to take care of. And I knew that my family loved me. And I was very confident and secure in myself. So those things never got to me that much. I mean, you know, it hurt a little bit. Somebody talks stuff on a playground, but that 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 comes and goes as it is as a kid anyway, right? Um, I think I was just I was benef I benefited from just that constant love, support, and encouragement from my family. Honestly, that's the only difference maker for me. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Theory, and so. Let's, uh, we're just moving right along. This next uh, question is to Dr. Lawrence Rashid. And so there's a question, can we get these slides? Can we get these slides? And I'm, I don't know if the answer is yes or no. Can we get these slides? So it's being recorded and it will be on um, the Lane website, so. I'm pretty sure they'll have access to the whole presentation. So the answer is yes. So I don't know if you're asking for the slide specifically from Mrs. Lang's presentation, but you know, this whole presentation video in totality will be available. Thank you so much, Dr. Rashid. All right, and we are moving right along. And this third question um, is for Mr. Pablo. Um, the question is, this, do you have any environmental review results from factories in Springfield and how it impacts the community? Again, Mr. Pablo, do you have any environmental review results from factories in Springfield and how it impacts the community? Mr. Pablo, the floor is yours. Yeah, so this whole environmental justice realm has been 
very new in, in Oregon. So in 2018, both Beyond Toxics and the NAACP of Eugene and Springfield were actually really pivotal in passing a, a law called Cleaner Air Oregon, which makes the state mandate uh, counties and cities to do those reviews of clean air specifically. And there's other, there's other things that they have to mandate in terms of water. And so what is needed right now actually is because the answer is no, there's no environmental review as of now that isn't coming directly from the EPA. Mm -hmm. And the EPA standards are so bad because of the administration that we have right now that they have kind of stopped doing all of the environmental reviews needed at the time. So what we need is people to put pressure on El Rapa, which is the lane uh, uh, air monitor monitoring agency that makes sure to do those environmental reviews. So we know that the law passed in 2018 and uh, this year, I don't know if they're still doing it because of COVID, but they had uh, stated that five companies in the Eugene Springfield area were going to be reviewed and those are coming out uh, next year. But I think because of Springfield, most people are talk when they talk about Springfield, they're talking about the, the paper company out there. And so we need people to email El Rapa. You can go just on, just look up L R A P A and there's a way to contact them and put pressure on them to review the paper company and their toxic emissions. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we have one, uh, one more question. Thank you so much, Mr. Alvarez. And this is from um, someone who wants to remain anonymous. And so I'm gonna do the best I can to read this. And, and uh, this can be answered by all of the, uh, the panelists, but we definitely wanna hear from some of the young people. Uh, we definitely wanna hear from some of the, the youth about this, and this is a local question. So it says, thank you so much for bringing this topic to the forum. What can we do to strengthen the city's commitment to the human rights declaration um, and equity? Decisions are being made without considering the black, the brown, and the poor in our community. Seeing and hearing the disparities between West Eugene and South Eugene presented by the last speaker, I'm very worried that the city is all talk and no do. A recent example um, uh, that was given in the presentation is the force move of ESL and ABSE, um, uh, the, the fourth floor of downtown LCC, reducing capacity and quality of educational spaces for this population, the most diverse at the college and representatives of many of our diverse members of our community in terms of race, ethnicity, and social economic levels. Would someone on the panel please speak to how we can get the city's attention on these matters and the obvious inequities that exist? Thank you very much. Anybody want to take that? Any young people? Anybody on the panel? Not all at once. All right. I got a few ideas. I right, go ahead, Mr. Henderson. I think, um, you know, I, we all have different ways of doing things. I myself, I'm a writer. Um, I find that the best way, in my opinion, from my experience is to, is to get the word out via some type of art for me writing. But um, the reality is a lot of people, you know, they, they get their, unfortunately, they get a lot of their information and stuff from art or YouTube or music or something. Um, and it's unfortunate that it's like that, but you know, there's, there's so many different forms of medium and what's really important in, in my eyes is getting in front of people, right? So once you get in front of people, then you can, you know, you can push your message. Uh, Eugene specifically is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge art town People appreciate artists of, of all types, whether it being musician, writers, uh, whatever. And, and it's just a really a matter of, of getting in, in people's faces, however you do it. You know, I know at the Eugene Weekly, um, we are always looking for um, youth writers. As a matter of fact, in this week's slant, we have a, we're asking for youth writers. So, um, you know, if, if, if you are of that age and you want to get your stuff out there, you know, the opportunity is there. Um, 
it's just it's just it's really just a matter of of just trying and reaching out to the people that are in those positions um, to speak to them. Now, I didn't grow up in Eugene, so I can't I wouldn't know what it would have looked like 10 years ago. But I know what it looks like now. And I know that now um, we're here and, you know, we you know, you can talk to us. So that's uh, that's what I would suggest. And um, I'm sure there's lots of other uh, ways to do it. All right. Um, anyone, thank you so much, Mr. Henderson. Anyone else? Um, I Hobby, go ahead. How you doing, Hobby? I, I really enjoyed the video that you made, really enjoyed. So let's, let's, let's talk about some of the solutions. How do we get the city's attention on these matters? Go ahead. Um, I go to South Eugene High School. And last year, we, um, my group, the, the group that I'm a part of is called EYES, Equity Youth Leadership. We get together every week and we talk about how the marginalized groups in Eugene can get together and how they can share their voices and exist in a predominantly white institution like my school. So I think it's important to give space to students to, uh, to talk about um, topics that aren't usually talked about in classes to learn about black history, because I feel like when it's predominantly white black people that are in that group. So I feel like if you know about your own history and you know about the town that you live in, that's how you can um, share your voices with people. And as a, as a whole club, we went to talk to the uh, school board about um, funding and uh, where we needed funds um, to truly share voices and to have spaces for marginalized people. Um, so that's what I would say. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Hobby. Thank you, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Hey, I'll, I'll chime in. I mean, okay. not to be the, the negative one of the naysayer, but so I've been here four years. I grew up in Memphis. I lived all over the world when I was in the Army. And I actually moved here from Utah. Uh, and some people be like, Utah. But one thing that Utah had that Eugene didn't was, like, there was a lot of Black unity because we, we realized it was safety in numbers. I mean, I used to walk down the street and hear somebody honking a horn and, and it was this black person saying, hey, here black folks that turn their nose and walk the other direction they see you. Don't let them have a, a white partner. Uh, mm -hmm. They really won't speak to you. Uh, which, you know, so, so, so two things. I think one thing I've noticed here is that people really, it, it seems no one wants to collaborate here. You know, even with like students, it blows my mind that U of O black students are closer to LCC black students and we got all these black student unions at these high schools, but th they aren't connected to black student unions at the university. Now that there are various reasons for that, but it just blows my mind that that unity piece isn't there. It seems like everybody wants to have their own thing. I know when all the stuff's going on this spring, all these different nonprofits were pop popping up and that's great, but it just didn't, people seem to be doing their own thing because they felt that somebody else wasn't doing good enough as opposed to doing stuff as a community. And, and so very, very segmented, uh, I think. But then also, I mean, I think there are a lot of spaces that are meant for black and brown folks that we allow allies in, which, you know, that's cool. But one thing that I say is like, my mom's a woman and I love her, but that don't necessarily mean I need to be in a women's space all the time. And so how do we, you know, tell these guys like, hey, you cool, but guess what? This ain't for you. And so a lot of times you can't really be yourself when you have so-called allies because, you know, as, as Brother Theory said, like a lot of these allies, they, they be the worst ones, you know, allies in sheep clothing, or as Dr. Rashid says, all lies are all eyes. And so those are the two things that I've noticed since I've been here that are hindering upper mobility for black people in Eugene, Springfield area. So, so you mentioned some of the black organizations that you feel like they have been gentrified? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, and you know, and sometimes that's cool. You know, I, I'm not one to tell an organization how to operate, but uh, you, you know, when you add other in there, it, it, it becomes a problem. Just like, you know, me as a cisgender heterosexual male, I don't need to be speaking for all kinds of other people. I need to be able to create a platform 
but uplift them and let them speak for themselves as opposed to me being the one who's speaking all the time. And you just don't really see that here. Uh, and, and, and it just blows my mind, you know? And I think there are a lot of, there's a lot of talent here. There's a lot of, you know, book and life educated people here where we can do some great things, but we need to unify and not make it about ourselves. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Pitt. All right, anybody else want to chime in? Olivia, do you want to chime in? Would you like to talk about some of the issues, local issues, and Eugene? No, if it. Sure, sorry, my dog was on my computer. No, not, not a problem. Um, I definitely think as a community, we need to be more together because it seems that we're all very split up. I'm not entirely sure how we can work on becoming more of like a together group, I guess per se, but I definitely think that there is some separation and uh, separation and like almost competitiveness with like each specific group when like we're all trying to go for the same goal. Mr. Mr. Thank you. Yeah, can I share something as well? Go for it. Um, I, I, you know, I, I totally I understand this question very well in my experience in Eugene, and of course, just being a, a, an Oregonian. But um, you know, we founded a group in in Beaverton last year that has been going a year strong now, called the Beaverton Black Parent Union. And it is, and we created with that intention of just creating a space for the black community of Beaverton, since pretty much everybody from somewhere else to build together and just be be together, but then also advocate, you know, at the at the policy level with the school district um, on behalf of our of our, of our kids, right? And I mean, you know, I think that there's just we've seen a lot of success and excitement around what we're doing. And we've even been able to secure like a decent amount of grant money uh, just in our first year because everyone recognizes there's this huge need because there's no black serving organizations or even black community dedicated organizations on the west side uh, of the metro area. And, and so um, I think just, you know, being able to create a space for people to first come together and, and, and just be together as a community um, and share space together is a really great start. But for us, we always have to add on that advocacy, that organizing lens, because there's so many things that we're, we all want to fight for in our community. All right. Thank you so much. And then, Mr. Alvarez, we're going to go ahead and close with you. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, talk about, because the question specifically said that it looked like city council was just all talk. And so I think something that's really important to understand is that white people across all the United States created a very specific political game. They created the rules that made it specifically so that they win every single time, right? And so, and one of the biggest ways that they made it this way was through all white organizations, right? They made it so that uh, city council doesn't have to fear a group like the NAACP coming at them because they're kind of low in numbers. But if a white group as let's say the Sierra Club or, the, or other organizations in Eugene that we know are all white are coming at them and making them fear that they might lose their job, it's, that, that's one of the biggest ways that, that politics, especially in city council works. And so uh, my biggest advocacy for the short term, there's a lot of policies that can go in place to be able to reach the this core systemic issue of why city council fears certain neighborhoods more than others. But the biggest one is what uh, Mr. Pitts was saying about going to organizations that are specifically made and led by the people that are trying to help and that, and, and that know how to play the, 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 the game by the Absolutely. rules, right? Because like, for example, fraternities were created as a way to job network after college and have this different uh, opportunities for, for work. And so black fraternities have to step up to be able to provide that same service because no one was providing it for black students. So I think that is very, very key is, is creating and having black led organizations uh, 
be the ones that are at the forefront of specific fights, but they need members. Like the NAACP really needs members. You go to uh, an NAACP uh, meeting and it's what uh, Mr. Pitts was saying, the, the, the half of the people there are going to be white and they are well-intentioned or Latino like myself and we're well-intentioned and everything and we want to do the work as allies, but at a certain point we have to step back and membership is really low. So I think the, the, the biggest thing that I could advocate for is joining those organizations that are specifically black led that know how to organize in a smart way. Thank you so much, Mr. Pablo. All right, and so we are, we are almost done. There is one last question. We just need one person to see if they can answer this question. Uh, is there an outreach to the middle and high school students to teach them the dynamics and the process of establishing unity. For example, explaining the time and place for inclusion and exclusion of allies. And so, any, in, any, anyone? Um, I kind of have an answer. Okay. So my, my Andy LaRoss has a program called the African American Black Student Success Program, I'm sorry, Black Success Program. It's through Lane ESD, Jason Floyd, Niles Mitash, and Billy, I'm not, I'm blanking on Billy's last name, but it's through Lane ESD and it's, through, and it's paid through the state and it's to help close the achievement gap and get black kids involved school and activities and things like that. All right. Well, that, thank you. Thank you so much, Olivia. Thank you so much. Um, so real quick, I got to give a shout out to the Rites of Passage of Lane College. And we have a multiplicity of Rites of Passage for, you know, Native, Indigenous, Asian, Island Pacific, or, um, Latinx, and of course, African American. Um, it's been doing great work in the community for over 20 plus years. Um, as Olivia alluded to, um, the Lane Navigators, um, you know, like Brother Pitts was talking about, you know, the local fraternities and sororities. Um, you know, you have Blacks in government, NAACP. There's a lot of individuals and organizations locally and even nationally, like another Black um, education network, you know, been doing great work. So. We have resources, like you all said, we just need to come together um, and make sure that we throw the equal out the room. You know what I mean? It's about us collectively as black folks. So I just want to acknowledge you, Brother Francis, for um, taking up the slack. I want to acknowledge everybody who's here, um, you know, my, my brothers, and, and, and not in crime, because we're not going to pathologize black men. Well, you know, the brothers who helped out, you know, um, Deontay Carter, Terry, Randy, you know, Mr. Evans, Terry, um, excuse me, Tracy, um, over in Equity Inclusion Office, and even over there at U of O, my colleagues, um, Damian Pitts, Stella Marie, you know, uh, you know, the Diversity and Inclusion um, Division, all of them. And again, thank you so much, Brother Theory. And I'm going to turn it over back to my brother from another mother who's doing a fantastic job. And like they say, peace and hair grease. Well, thank you so much. Um, I just want to close and say this was a wonderful, wonderful event. Stokely Carmichael once talked about the need of Blacks to go from mobilization to organization. How do we organize? Because our power is only in the collective masses. Uh, Marcus Garvey once said this, the greatest weapon used against the Negro is disorganization. Dr. Claude Anderson always says, racism is a team sport. Either we play together as a team or we lose by default. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. On behalf of Lane College, Dr. Lawrence Rashid, we wanna say good night. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care.